and welcome to the Freakish Lemon video podcast. I am your host, the Freakish Lemon. I go by Adrian. I use masculine pronouns. This is a crafty type podcast. Oh, I missed a whole chunk of this intro. Welcome to any new viewers. Thank you so much for clicking on whatever you clicked on to get here. And welcome back, returning viewers. Thanks for stick around, sticking around with this buh, buh, words. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, this is a Crafty Tie podcast coming to you from the northwest hills of Connecticut, which includes uh, Tunxis, Pagusset, and Mohican homelands. And um, show notes for this episode and all episodes can be found at freakishlemon.com. Uh, we have a group on Ravelry. Just search Freakish Lemon in the groups tab. You can follow me at all the fun places like Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, and Ravelry. As Freakish Lemon, all the links to these things will be in the down bar here on YouTube or somewhere around here if you're watching this somewhere else. And if you are here on YouTube and you want to follow along with this thing that I do, consider hitting that subscribe button. I am filming this on Saturday, June 22nd, 2019, and we're coming to you from a different corner of my bedroom. I decided I should maybe work with the light coming through the windows instead of against the light coming through the windows. So that's why we're in this corner. This is a never be before seen filming corner. Um, that's the door to my bedroom. That's a weird little corner that only that DVD rack fits in. Um, and we can see I've got a storage unit with some Legos on it. And this right here is my desk. I don't know how else to explain uh, this corner. It's the opposite of the corner that you've seen before with the bookshelf in it. So if that helps put any of this into perspective. Um, and just behind me you can see, just in case anybody was wondering, uh, these are a couple of paintings I did on some old jeans of windmills. That is a commissioned bit of artwork that a coworker gave me because I made her a goat balaclava and she commissioned this uh, Grand Moff Tarkin sort of pseudo-Catholic iconography stained glass window thing, which is great. That's a dragon. These are my enamel pins and those are some just regular button pins posters and artwork along the walls. Something does need to go there though. I haven't figured out anything to go in there yet. It'll happen eventually. Um, before I get too much further, happy pride because it is June. Also happy African American Music Appreciation Month and also happy Caribbean American Heritage Month. I do have one bullet point under podcast stuff, uh, but this is just a reminder that this episode and most of the recent episodes are closed captions and there are transcripts of the closed captioning files uh, included in the show notes over at freakishlemon.com. I have updated my notes template to actually include that information as part of the intro, um, but I just wanted to put it out there because it had been a while since I mentioned it. If anybody wants to help me work on the closed captioning files for back episodes, uh, feel free to get in touch. I do have a thing set up where you can help. So if you want to do that, that would be appreciated. Um, but just know that I think it's from episode 60 forward or something like that. Um, they are closed captioned by an actual human person, not a YouTube algorithm attempt. Although the YouTube algorithm attempt is pretty good these days, uh, but it, it just doesn't understand words coming out of my mouth sometimes when they're specific to fiber crafting. The first thing on my list to talk about is dye stuff. I did say in, I think, last episode that maybe I would do a recap at the end of the year and I've just completely thrown that out the window because I had uh, Memorial Day weekend dye adventures and I will 
never figure out what I was doing, or it, it'll take too long for me to figure out what I was doing before. So I'll do periodic batches of stuff that I've dyed that I want to show you. Um, so yeah, over Memorial Day weekend, which was, I want to say a week or two after I posted my last episode, um, I did some natural dye experiments. Um, I did the all-in-one dye method, so I cooked up the dye stock and then I added an 8% of the dry weight of my fiber of alum to that dye bath and just plopped wet fiber samples in there. I do have notes on all of this, but this is kind of the gist of what I was doing. Um, all of these samples ended up staying in the dye bath as it cooled for at least eight hours. Most of them were overnight. I do have two portable burners that I use in my craft room for dyeing, so I had two pots going at once. Um, so let me show you what I played around with. So the first, well, I say the first thing. I've bullet pointed this, but it. please note that each of these things is by twos because I had two pots going at a time. So some of these combinations seem a little weird, but it's because I had two pots going at a time. So the first thing I'm going to show you is uh, yellow onion skins. Uh, which is, you know, a well-documented natural dye material. These are all onion skins that were either saved by my parents or that I snatched from the grocery store. <laughs> yep. Because, uh, frankly, they don't care if you're walking it. Well, I shouldn't say that. My local grocery store didn't care about me picking through the onions if I was just grabbing onion skins because there's it's trash <laughs> frankly um so I just went through the self-checkout and just stuffed the bag of onion skins in with the rest of my purchases so these are the colors that I got with uh my yellow onion skins um I think it was something like 50 grams of yellow onion skins and there was definitely more than one type of onion in there, but I couldn't tell you what they were. So here are my fabric samples. This one is a linen and that one is a cotton, which both took the color pretty well, which is unusual in my experience for plant fibers. Plant fibers and protein, so I should say cellulose fibers and protein fibers tend to take color very differently. And they definitely did in the yarn, but I was impressed with how similar the colors were, because you'll see some examples later where the colors are very, very different. Um, this is a cotton yarn, uh, which turned basically the same color as my fabrics. And these are wool. They're both BFL. This is a BFL tweed. This is just a regular... BFL, um, both fingering weight yarns, um, and you can see the protein fiber definitely took up the color differently, kind of more of an orange than a yellow. Um, but I think that first dye bath was pretty well concentrated, so um, so this do this color doesn't come up again later. So. I was very surprised by this, but this is yellow onion skins. And you may wonder what I'm doing with all these samples. Right now I'm just collecting them. <laughs> I will figure out things to do with them, never fear. Uh, also in a pot I had red onion skins going, which actually turned out to be a more kind of yellow a cooler yellow than the yellow onion skins. Yellow onion skins are much warmer because we're getting orange tones in there. The red onion skins was cooler. Um, I don't know if my camera will be able to pick this up, but there's actually a little bit of a slight green undertone in the fabrics. It's not as present in the yarn, but in the fabrics, 
it wouldn't look out of place next to a bunch of greens. So again, I have a cotton and I have a linen and I have a cotton yarn and BFL tweed yarn. See, this one turned out more of a tan than a yellow, which was interesting. But both took them the, the color very in a very saturated way. And then my notes fell asleep per usual. So then I put a second batch of fibers in each of those dye baths. So nope, not you. So this was the second go around with the yellow onion skins. This is, oh, what fiber were you? Possibly the aloe fiber? Yes. Um, it was a lace weight undyed aloe fiber that I bought on a cone from the shop Yarn Italy on Etsy. And this is how it, you can see it's a lot less saturated than the previous. I, my samples are all pretty precariously balanced on the arm of a chair over here. There we go. Less saturated. Um, yeah, definitely less of that orange tone from the first go round. And then this is some mohair from Cold Goats Farm, which is a local farm here in Connecticut. Um, it's a mohair and fin wool blend. I opened this as if you could see it. Um, and this yarn did have a kind of a gray, grayish base. Um, so this did end up darker. It actually is a little bit, your eye wants to perceive it as green sometimes because of the gray kind of heathering in the yarn. I'm not sure if this is the final dye for this yarn. I might go over it with blue uh, if my woad grows um, for a green because it seems to want to be a green with those gray undertones. And I haven't decided if I'm going to do the same thing with this yet. Um, this aloe fiber was a kind of a soft beige. So I'm not sure that yellow, that this yellow took the way I wanted it to, so it might get over dyed again. I don't know. But it was worth it to see what would happen. And then I threw this bit of hand spun into the red onion dye bath. This bit of hand spun, I don't have it written down, but there is uh, camel fiber and silk fiber and I think merino in here. Um, it was already kind of a, a tan color and the red onion dye did very little to it. Um, I'm not sure how to explain how the color changed because it did change slightly. It's just less, less brown a little bit. I don't know. So this one will definitely get over dyed again at some point because it's not really a color that I use. Either the original or the over dyed. So it's not a failure. It just didn't do anything really. Um, and then in the yellow onion dye bath, I threw in some avocado pits um, because there were so many warm tones that I wanted to see how it would affect an avocado pit dye bath. 
Um, I did add some baking soda to up to um, change the pH of the water, but it didn't pull out as much color as my previous avocado pit experiments had been. I don't know if it was maybe the type of av avocado or how small the pits were, <laughs> but um, let me see. So the onion, the yellow onion and avocado um, dyed this fiber. This is a cellulose fiber. It is a sugarcane fiber, I believe. Um, so it's a light yellow. Um, and it's a soft yellow. This one may stay on its own, but it may also get over dyed with something. Um, I haven't really decided yet. I mostly got these fibers. This was also on a cone from Yarn Italy uh, on Etsy. I mostly got these fibers because I'd never played with these fibers before, so I wanted to play with them. But that's yellow onion skin and avocado. I'm not sure the avocado really did much to the dye bath. It might have been overpowered by the onion skin, so it's probably just mostly a third batch onion skin. And then to the red onion dye bath, I added dried clementine peels because I still had some from a previous uh, collection of clementine peels. So this is what the fabric turned out to be, uh, just kind of a yellowy off-white. Uh, this is the cotton and this is the linen, and this is more in line with what my previous dye experiments have yielded. Very soft, not very saturated colors. Um, and this is also more in line with what my yarns have turned out like. Um, both of these were previously dyed with iron and birch, um, and they didn't have very much color except for from the iron. Um, but it was also very early on in my dye experiments, so I might not have been doing things right with the birch bark. But you can see this skein is, you see this color here is all from the iron. So it's still very light, very soft. And this one took up a lot more color because it is the protein fiber. This is the BFL Tweed. Um, so this is really what I've seen from natural dyeing thus far, just in different shades of colors, um, where the protein fiber will take up a lot and the cellulose fiber will not take up very much at all. So then I took both of those onion combo dye baths, the yellow onion and the avocado, and the red onion and the clementine peels, poured them into one pot because there was still color in the bath, but I wanted to try some new stuff. So I did a big combo dye bath and I got these samples. So again, one cotton, one linen, which ended up like a true beige, just like soft beige. Both of these fabrics were white before. And then um, the BFL tweed and the regular BFL, which ended up as kind of like a warm, light caramel color. Um, you'll also notice in my samples that the BFL doesn't pick up colors as warm, or the BFL tweed doesn't pick up colors as warmly as the regular BFL, which is interesting. And uh, honestly makes me disinclined to use the BFL tweed um, going forward. I might just stick to the BFL because I do like how the colors take up in this BFL yarn. Dang, what 
was this one? Oh, okay. So then in a new pot, I uh, did some apple tree twigs. Uh, we have several apple trees in the backyard. One of the branches fell off in a rainstorm, so I took off some branches and uh, cut them into about inch pieces. I soaked them in water for about 24 hours, and then I cooked them for about an hour um, on a simmering, not boiling heat, which is pretty much what I do for all of my dye stock, is a simmering heat for about an hour. And that yielded very interesting results. First of all, it smelled like apple cider, which seems weird to me because it was twigs and not actually any apple fruit part of the tree. Very weird. Um, and then it yielded these, and the dye bath was the color of apple cider, just straight up. And it yielded these soft, um, yeah, like these soft caramelly colors. Um, again, a pretty beige job on the fabrics. This is the linen, this is the cotton, uh, but one BFL skein and one BFL tweed skein. Yeah, I didn't throw a cotton one in here. Again, this sort of like soft, light caramel color. Still smells a little bit like apples, which is interesting. But that's a pretty cool, pretty accessible foraging item if you are into foraging for natural dyes. Um, at least where I am, apple trees are pretty common. So that's pretty neat. And then I took that apple twig dye stock and poured it into the big combo vat. And this is the color that I got on a skein of BFL. <laughs> like that's still a pretty rich color considering that dye bath is basically all the exhaust dye baths for a full 100 gram skein. And then a new dye bath, I took um, the dried rose petals from a dozen uh, dark red roses and I ended up with these samples. So here's the cotton and here's the linen. I'm not sure if my camera will be able to pick up what my eyeballs can see, but it's almost like a desaturated mauve color. Um, the dye bath was a really pretty dark red purple, but it faded as it sat in the dye bath overnight and went kind of a gray. Um, the cotton yarn had picked up, and again, I'm not sure if my camera will be able to show this to you. It had picked up some of those red tones, so it was a little bit more mauve in the cotton, opposed to the BFL tweed, which ended up this kind of a a tan with gray undertones. It's very interesting. That was the end of my dye experiments for Memorial Day. Um, but I really like doing it that way with the two pots and then just like combining exhaust baths so I'm not just getting lighter and lighter colors. I'm ending up with colors with different tones, but they interact with each other differently. It's kind of weird. Definitely not like a repeatable thing that I could aim for, but it's fun to do with these like experiment samples. If you have any questions about my processes for that, um, feel free to leave a question somewhere and I'll go refer to my notes. Uh, as to what I actually did for any of those things. Um, 
but I just thought you might be interested to see what was coming out of um, some natural dye experiments. So let's move on to some finished objects. I have two finished objects to show you today. The first is my hand spun sweater. Yeah. I'm so excited that this is done. Now that it's too hot for me to wear. Uh, this is a sweater pattern that I self-drafted. Here's my pattern <laughs> with scribbles all over it. Um, I used the drafting techniques from Knitting Pattern Essentials by Sally Melville, which if you are aiming to knit sweaters a lot, uh, especially pieced sweaters, it is a really good resource and I recommend it. Um, this sweater was knit on my uh, LK150 Silver Reed knitting machine. Um, this was the original swatch, which you can see why my calculations didn't work out for the first sweater I did. Um, and these were my follow-up swatches, which are considerably bigger. And actually in the pattern that I had intended to put the sweater in. But the first time I made this sweater, I had so much hand spun left over that I decided to skip that stripe. So here is my sweater. It is a set in sleeve, long sleeved crew neck sweater with one by one rib in black for the cuffs um, and the waistband and the neckband. Everything else is in my hand spun, which is, did I write it down? Yes, I did. Um, it's from Spinner's Hill Farm. I had origin I had bought basically a ball of roving, roving that had been wound up into a ball that was um, 20 ounces, so a full pound and a quarter. And I spun it up and I made this sweater out of it. Which I'm so pleased by. Um, the things about this sweater fit, it's a little bit longer than I had anticipated, but it's not a bad length, it's a length that I like. Um, the armhole depth is a little, a little bit wide. And that's something I think to watch out for in the next sweater that I do if I'm going to draft another sweater. I probably will now that I've done it once, um, at least for um, plain stockinette sweaters. Um, so that's something for me to keep in mind in the future is the depth of that armhole compared to the depth of this armhole. The only thing that I'm not particularly pleased about on this sweater is the bind off on the neckband. Let me just do this. And that's, I think, just the nature of the bind off from my knitting machine. It's a little bit loose. It's tightened up some with blocking, but it's still, you can see it, it's not as tight as it should be. And I don't know if that's a byproduct of me laddering up the stitches and reforming them or just the gauge and the space between the needles on the machine. I think next time I will bind off the neckband by hand and see if that is any better. Um, and if not, maybe doing two rows by hand so that it's a smaller gauge, just like one or two rows, just to pull it in a smidge so that it doesn't kind of flare out at the bind off. Uh, but that's the only thing that really bothers me about the sweater. And it's minimal bother. I, I probably won't even notice it when I pull it out to wear it in the fall. Um, 
it's just, you know, when you block it out all nice and neat and you're like, it's perfect. Oh, except for that neckline. <laughs> but um, because of the way I do it on the machine, I seam up one side of one shoulder and then I hang the full neckline on the machine, do up the neckband, bind it off, and then seam the other side. It would be a pain to because to, to do this, I would have to unstitch this seam, tink it back, and then close it up and then redo the seam. And I'm not going to bother with it. That's more fuss than I'm willing to put into a stock in that sweater. I have a hand spun, so it's already uneven all over the place. Because my hand spun is not even. Um, but I'm very pleased with having my first hand spun sweater. Also, I still have this much hand spun left. That was an absurd amount of yarn. I could have done this whole thing in hand spun. Now I know. Um, if this is still my spinning gauge, about 20 ounces is what I need <laughs> to do a sweater with enough for multiple swatches and emergency skein. But that's done. And this was one of my make nine for 2019, which is very exciting. And then my second finished object is a work in progress I've had for literal years. It is a bit of cross stitch. It is the Star Wars Arabesh sampler pattern by Ad Leones. Um, upside down. And here it is. There's crease lines because I've had it folded. But this is on an even weave linen. I don't remember the count of it. But there is the Orabesh alphabet sampler. I'm so pleased to finally have it done. Uh, I have my reference photos on my phone so that I can look for a frame for it. That's very satisfying. And again, I've had this in progress for literal years, um, mostly because it's, I'm used to doing the kind of cross stitch where the entire portion of the pattern is covered in stitches, so it's real easy to count around, but this is a lot of space between stitches, and I never knew if I was counting correctly, so I would, it was a lot of mental energy to make sure I was putting the letters in the right place, especially with the Orbesh letters, because they're not letters that I use all the time, so it's hard to gauge. <laughs> Is this correct? Did I count this right? But I'm very pleased with this. Can't wait to have it on my wall. That's it for finished objects. So works in progress. My knitting has primarily been focused on this project. This is the Comfort Fade Cardi by Andrea Mowry. Um, all in Once Upon a Corgi yarns. There are eight colors in total. Two of them being held together in each color section. And I am now about a third of the way through the uh, waistband. So here's the start of the sweater, split for the sleeves. And here I am in the last color grouping in the ribbing portion. So progress is steady on this sweater. Uh, it helps that I'm holding the yarns two together to, so it does actually account for a DK weight. Uh, and my gauge is looser than her gauge, so I'm actually knitting a much smaller size than I would wear by the name. Uh, but my math worked out, we hope. Um, <laughs> it worked out on the last sweater. I'm trusting it to work out on this sweater. 
um, it's a bit shapeless right now, just because of the nature of top-down raglans before sleeves are put on them. But I'm excited for the progress on this sweater. Um, but I think once I finish this sweater, I'm going to focus on the other works in progress that I have currently on the needles, um, because a couple of them are pretty old. Um, yeah. So that's chugging along. And I've got a new work in progress to show you. This is a uh, machine knit. I'm calling it my blue cone boxy sweater. I took the measurements from the boxy pattern um, because Hohi Locatelli, the, the boxy sweater by Hohi Locatelli, she has the finished measurements um, listed in the pattern information. Um, so it's going to be similar to that style of sweater, but um, I'm mostly using techniques that I learned from Renee Callahan's sweater blank sweater pattern um, to actually assemble it because I'm using this uh, mystery blue cone that uh, Gabby from the Once Upon a Corgi podcast uh, got from, oops, I forgot there were all these little things in this bag got um her friend got it from a closing mill so it's not labeled and it's a little bit absurd so let me show you the first thing i did which was the longest tube swatch known to man half of m most of my labels have fallen off of this and it's a little bit uh, linty because I threw it in the washer and the dryer just to get an idea of what washing it would do. So here is the longest swatch known to man. This is the lintiest. This is the yarn. It's a single, so it probably was supposed to be spun into something else or used in possibly weaving it i'm not sure what that mill was for i did a burn test on this yarn and um it didn't melt it burned but it burned a weird color but i don't know if the weird color was just from the dye that's left dye and possibly probably um spinning chemicals left on the yarn but it did burn like a cotton so i'm guessing it's a cotton but it is extremely thin it is cobweb possibly bordering on thread um so what i did to figure out what i could even do with it is i did this monster swatch of i don't remember how many rows even in every single dial setting on my um, KH836E, which is a standard gauge brother knitting machine. So as you go through this tube, it gets tighter and tighter <laughs> until you get down to literally the smallest possible knitting gauge. And it's still see-through. So this is more kind of a throw on on a summer night garment. Uh, I ended up going for, where are you? That's a one dot. Zero. I ended up going for a one, which is somewhere around this gauge. It's hard to show because it's a giant snake. So somewhere around this gauge, because my machine started getting really unhappy down at zero. So I did this giant swatch. And then I swatched 
and I've forgotten to go grab those swatches, so I'll just tell you about them. I swatched for stockinette and I swatched for a tuck pattern using the um, punch card on my machine. It's uh, punch card number two. So if you're familiar with machine knitting, it's the every other stitch for two rows and then switching. Um, and I swatched that on the long setting. So it needs each row in the card twice. Oh boy. <laughs> I figured that was a great way to use up a bunch of this cone. So, did out my math, wrote out my pattern, and then immediately knit my tiny little sleeves, because that, the boxy pattern has tiny little sleeves, so they'll probably be somewhere like here. If that makes any sense. So here's my tiny little sleeves. And you can see on my sleeves that there is a considerable bias in this yarn because it is a single and it was probably meant to be plied with something else. So after this project, I may just set it aside and split it into plies and spin it together in the opposite direction so that it's actually usable for things other than playing around with. Um, but again, that's pretty see-through. And then I did the sweater back, which is, um, again, I said I'm doing according to the sweater blank pattern by Renee Callahan, which is a rectangle, because that's a beginner pattern to kind of get familiar with your machine. So this rectangle has 46 stockinette rows to start, um, did 44, and then did a I forgot what this is called. Uh, fold over hem. There is a name for it, but I've forgotten what it is. So 44 stitches and then um, 44 rows and then two rows just to get that attached and set up. And this is across 196 stitches the machine has 200 needles. I wanted to have that extra two needles um, as a buffer so that I definitely knew that the punch card would pick up the next row of the machine. And then the rest of the sweater back is a full 766 rows of knitting. Uh, did I hurt myself doing that? Yes, because I'm terrible at pacing myself. So, here is the sweater back. Over 800 rows of knitting. Here we have, these little markers are where the neck is. Because it's a rectangle. And the thing about tuck stitch is that it's wider than stockinette. So, when I hold up this piece, you can see that basically the middle of this is, it pulls in at the stockinette at the bottom, and then I did two rows of stockinette at the top, just so it would be easier to seam together later, and it pulls in there too. Which, I don't know if it'll uh, affect the overall shape of this boxy sweater, because I don't know how these boxy sweaters work. Um, but it was a lot of knitting. There's also, you can see these strings off, maybe you can't, they're very small, off the side. There is one needle, probably three in from the end, where I think four or five times it dropped a stitch. I don't know if it's just that needle or if it was how I was starting and stopping in my breaks, because I, I did this over the course of a week. Um, because it was a lot of knitting. About a hundred rows is about this much. <laughs> um, yeah. 
So this is as basically as wide as I could get a piece off of the machine, probably for, I don't know, it's probably enough ease that it fits the boxy sweater uh, parameters. Um, and I'm not, how do I phrase this? So looking at the boxy sweater, it's not a sweater that directly appeals to me because I like the shape of the sweater or anything. Mostly I'm curious as to how a boxy sweater would fit me because it's the people that I see wearing the boxy sweater are all pretty slim people just through what I've seen. Um, I mean, I have seen a couple of people larger than a stick uh, wearing it, but there's usually some kind of alteration made to it, like cropping it or other things. And people claim that it's a good sweater shape for everyone, but I don't necessarily believe people when they say things like that. So I figured I could try it out knitting one on the machine in a yarn that I have no other use for. And if it doesn't look good, then this type of thing would be real easy to give to somebody. Um, especially if I finish it right in the middle of summer, this would be a great like beach throw over for somebody if it ends up looking terrible on me. <laughs> so that was my reasoning. I also didn't anticipate having to take a week to knit the sweater back because it was over 800 rows. <laughs> that math caught me by surprise. And then I was like, oh yeah, this is a very fine yarn. Of course it's going to be a lot of rows. I didn't anticipate how many rows I would be feeling in my back and in my abdominal muscles as I went the full length of the bed with the knitting carriage. <laughs> with a cotton yarn, so there's no stretch and there's resistance the whole way. Did not plan that very well. Um, so when I finished this, I did a second swatch using that same punch card, but I did it on the, the normal punch card, the short triangle. <laughs> there's no good, there's no good universal terminology for knitting machines because it seems like they're all slightly different. So on my machine, there's a little circle for stop, so it's not doing anything with the punch card. Then there's a short triangle for changing the punch card every row, and then a long triangle for knitting two rows on one line, and then knitting two rows on the next line. So I have swatched out the short triangle, um, which again is the same pattern, it's just how many tucks are actually tucked. So on my sweater back, it's four strands are tucked. And on this one, it's two strands are tucked. Uh, but now that it's blocked and everything, it's definitely not... I mean, I could do it. But I think there would be some weird weight distribution in the sweater itself, since the tuck with the four strands is going to be a lot heavier than the tuck with the two strands. So I'm just going to have to do the front the way I had originally planned it and just maybe take two weeks to do it <laughs> instead of one week so that I don't damage myself. So that's the plan with that. Um, I did start a new project because I realized that I don't keep anything in my work bag for knitting. And, um, I don't know, it just struck me as that was weird. So I basically cast on a tube for, um, 
keeping in my knitting bag. You'll probably not see this for 50 million years after this episode. Um, because I don't think it's going to be something I'm going to be working on regularly, just kind of like my emergency knitting. So it's just a um, fingering weight yarn. This is Pinstripes Are In by Once Upon a Corgi. It's, I think, her only self-striping yarn colorway that she's ever done. It was part of the series of Unfortunate Events uh, clubs. And here we go. Here's an inch of a cuff. It's a one by one cuff knit on size zero, uh, which is two millimeter needles. Uh, once I get to the stockinette, I'll switch over to Magic Loop, and then it'll just be a long sock tube with um, ribbing on each end, and I'll cut it in half, add toes, and then cut in heels. But like I said, this is kind of my emergency knitting, so it's not really an active project. I just wanted to show you that I had it. Next project is cross stitch because I finished my ages old sampler. I decided to go with a simpler project. Of course I still screwed it up because I was working on black Ada fabric in the middle of the night without sufficient light because I'm a genius. Uh, this is the Jedi Order symbol by Woot Graf Graphic Design on Etsy. I don't know if their shop is still around. Um, this is on 14 count black Ada fabric. Um, you can see I did the outline of the circle. And as I was going through the interior part, all the counts were off. So somewhere on one side, I screwed up the count. Um, while I was watching Gotham in the dark and not counting the fabric correctly. So I unpicked all of the circle. Uh, all that leftover fuzz will either be removed or covered up when the circle actually goes in. But I'm gonna finish out this bit. Um, and then go back to the circle. This is the only part I left because that's accurate. There's just, I think two or three more cross stitches to go above and then it's that with the circle all the way around and then I'll go in and I'll fill in um, the other gold so it's just the one color gold on black Ada fabric uh, I'll finish this in a hoop so I can just stick it on the wall except for the counting nice and easy And then next I have spinning. I lost where everything is. Okay. So I finished the um, Greenwood Fiber Works Mallard singles. And over it I spun these singles. These are uh, Classy Squid Fiber Company, the Raven King, which is a two ounce bat. Um, again, this is on my Ashford Kiwi 2. I drafted these in kind of a supported long draw because you can do that with bats fairly easily. Um, and the classy squid fiber bats just tell me what they want to be. I don't have any control over them. Um, so that's that. And that's it for these bobbins. These bobbins are done and they're going to wait until I have a plying party where I ply up all the yarn in the universe. Uh, which means that I had to start a new bobbin on my wheel. So here's the first bobbin. This is some uh, Falkland, I think Merino. This is from the Great Dye Experiment of August a few years ago uh before well really where gabby from once upon a corgi uh discovered her love of dyeing things um because she's my sister so we decided to have a dye experiment day and this was one of i think this was the the fiber i used to clean up the dye pot because <laughs> there was some red in there and some blood like i just started chucking in the leftover little dye amounts we had 
So it's mostly blue with a little bit of purple because we mostly had red and blue left. So one bobbin is going to be this braid of fiber. Let me get my bag of little fluffs. So that's going to be one ply of this yarn. This is my hand dyed fiber, which is slightly felty. So it's a little bit slow going, but I didn't know what I was doing. And then the other ply will be this fiber. Take it out of the bag so you can see it. Uh, which use uh, Phoenix Fiber Co. Lakeshore. This came out of somebody's D-stash. I think somebody from Gabby's knit group, maybe. It's possibly even somebody I know. I've just forgotten because I have a brain like Swiss cheese. So that's going to be the other ply. And um, this fiber, I didn't write down what fiber content is. Is that label in here? It's alpaca merino silk. So I don't know if I've told you on the podcast my spinning plans right now. Uh, a lot of my spinning stash is impulse, impulse buys and one-off braids of fiber that don't go with each other. Um, and I don't know what to do with it. So what I'm aiming to do right now is to spin up as much of that as I can this year um, so that I have it as a finished yarn. As a finished yarn, I can, you know, clip off a sample of it, put it on an index card or a tag or something, and I can bring that with me to festivals on yarn crawls, that kind of thing, to find a yarn that will go with it to put it with a project. It's a little bit harder for me personally to even figure out what types of fibers go with other types of fiber. I, it, hmm, words are hard. I can't do the same thing with a bit of the fiber to match with other fibers because I'm not a very controlled spinner. I spin how the yarn wants me to spin it basically um, and what my hands are comfortable with. So two braids that might look exactly identical might spin up differently if they're different fibers or if it's a different type of day or how they were dyed even might have different color interactions. So unless I'm buying, you know, three or four braids at once from the same, not even the same dye lab, but you know, from the same festival booth or the same store or whatever. Um, that seems like an intentional spin, but trying to find things that go with braids that I already have is hard to do. I can more easily match it if it's already a yarn. And usually I end up with ideas for what to do with it while I'm spinning. So I'm trying to uh, go through those one-off stash fibers so that I have intentions for what to do with them uh, and I'm trying to be more intentional for the fiber that I do buy in the future so aiming to buy more than one braid of a thing so that I have a kind of an idea of what I can do with the finished yarn because just one four ounce braid the only thing that I've really sometimes successfully managed with that is a hat um and sometimes not sometimes that's not even enough depending on how i spun it so um there's gonna be lots of one-off spinning in the future uh for my spinning updates so i've got two more works in progress to show you real quick i have finished the weaving on my combo weaving sewing project. Um, this, these are all cotton uh, or linen or hemp blended yarns. Um, just an even weave pseudo plaid. Um, and these will be made into a vest for my Renaissance Fair costume. 
So I've taken it off the loom. I have measured it, washed it, remeasured it. It's narrower than what my original calculations uh, came out to be, which is fine because my muslin sample was a little bit wider than I wanted, but I figured, you know, I could just take in the seams um, when I figured out what my actual finished width would be if I needed to. Uh, and it's also a little bit longer than I had anticipated, which is great because that was another thing I had with a, another thing I noticed about the muslin is a little too short because of belting it at the waist for my costume. So the fabric itself is finished and I have woven in these orange lines for uh, basically four even pieces. So um, once I stitch reinforcements along either side of that line, that's where um, these pieces will be cut. And then I can trace out the pattern pieces onto the fabric and assemble. The only thing I'm debating now, well, I do have to figure out what fabric to use for um, bias binding um, for the neckline and I think the armholes. Uh, but I also need to figure out if I want to use fabric for the reinforcement tags or weave little reinforcement tags because there's three of them there's one at the neckline um and then two on either side where it splits at the hip so i don't know if i'm going to weave something for that or if i'm going to just sew a piece of fabric on there that's literally the last thing to do on the project so i've got time to think about it but it's something to keep in mind and i do have plenty of this yarn left <laughs> because i don't know how to calculate any yardage ever and i always overbuy but that's a nice bit of progress. And I've also started on a half square triangle quilt using uh, Moda five inch charm squares. I'll put in a video here of what the current state of the squares are. I have made all the half square triangles and I'm in the process of trimming them down. I'm trimming them down pretty consider considerably because some of them have warped a lot and this is a gift project so I want them to be even as possible. Um, right. That's also a Make 9 2019 project, so I am really doing well with these make with my Make 9 2019 projects. I feel really accomplished and hopefully I'll get through all nine of them. So that's it for works in progress. I do have a couple of swatches. I talked about future swatches last episode. I have two swatches for combining machine knit and hand knitting um, so that I can do machine knit colorwork yoke sweaters and then just, wait, did I say that right? Hand knit colorwork yoke and then machine knit all the plain stock in it in the body and the sleeves. So I have two, oh, where did that come from? I have two swatches, which basically look identical, but I think that was because of my hand knitting <laughs> tension. Um, so here's the first one I did. The, the um, two rows of the silver here and this leftover knit picks, um, Wool of the Andes Sport. This is from my Slytherin scarf. I knit my little swatches in the gauge I used for my scarf. Um, so I have a long swatch here that I can take measurements off of if I need to. And then a tiny little swatch back here so that I could go in the round. Um, so all of my machine knit swatch pieces are, what is it? Dial tension three on the LK150 and the um, tension rod at three as well. Um, when I picked this one up, I did no selvage stitches, so I picked up every single stitch uh, because I forgot <laughs> about selvage stitches. And then I knit this color work in a US three 
um, which is a 3.25 millimeter needle and bound it off. So the three is actually pretty good. Um, there is a little bit of a pucker where the pieces meet, just a slight one because I didn't account for that selvage edge. In order to seam it up, you need one stitch on either side to do mattress stitch. Um, but it blocked out pretty evenly. You can see they're right there. There's a little bit of a indent because of that extra stitch. But I did knit the color work fairly loosely because I hadn't done color work in a while. And then I did it again with a US 4, which is a 3.5 millimeter needle. And this doesn't look right at all. I think my hands were too tense <laughs> on the color work. So you can actually see when I stick my hand in it, it's a lot less elastic than how I knit it with the three. Um, <laughs> so I probably have to do this with a four again. Um, this one I did leave a uh, selvage stitch. Um, so the stitches, I, I picked up all the stitches except for one on each end of the machine knit swatch. Um, and yeah, if I knit with the four the way I knit with the three, I think I would have been kind of in the golden zone there. Uh, but apparently I was real stressed. <laughs> I think this one I knit on a weekday after work instead of on a weekend when I'm relaxed. So I'm going to read, I have another, um, another couple of swatches. So I'm going to redo with the fours, um, this swatch and see if it works out better, but I did try to go up to a five, but I couldn't get the needles through the stitches. So, so a three or a four is basically my zone. So if I was maybe doing something where I wanted the color work to pull in, I would knit more tightly, but I think a four at a loose tension would be pretty good. Which is exciting to know. I thought I'd have to do a lot more experimentation because my hand knitting gauge is so loose. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think the color work helps me that way. Because I do have to be more conscious of knitting evenly that it's easier to get an idea of what size I should be knitting. I'm not sure if that made sense just now, but I'm considering this experiment a success because I do have planned for my Make 9 2019 a sweater in this exact yarn, um, but in a red and a gray. So that's helpful to know. And then I have just a quick couple of things for other stuff that I want to tell you about before you can go on with the rest of your day. Um, stuff I'm, stuff I'm listening to. I have two new podcasts that I wanted to mention. Um, the case of Charles Dexter Ward, which is a BBC Four production of the H.P. Lovecraft short story by the same name. And it's done as, uh, like a true crime investigative podcast, which I think is super interesting and fun to listen to. I've only listened to the first episode, but I'm pretty excited about listening to the rest of it. And then I've been listening to Blackout, which is a fiction thriller about a radio DJ in a uh, small town, New Hampshire. There's kind of a, an apocalyptic scenario starting to go down. Um, the uh, radio DJ is voiced by Rami Malek, um, 
So there's some some pretty awesome talent involved in this podcast, and it's pretty interesting to listen to. And then stuff I'm playing this week, Harry Potter Wizards Unite came out, uh, which is basically Pokemon Go for Harry Potter things. Um, it is still early days, so you can take my comments with a grain of salt if you like. I think it's an all right game for the like two days that I've played it. Uh, but I think it's leaning too heavily on the aesthetic of the Harry Potter world. Um, it's just too graphics heavy, I think, to be as successful a game as Pokemon Go. Because the thing about Pokemon is it's the design of Pokemon is a much simpler design. I mean, it, it's basically line drawings rendered 3D. Um, so things move a lot quicker in Pokemon Go than they do in the current iteration of Harry Potter Wizards Unite. And the animations, I think, are way too long. Uh, I made a comment on uh, Gabby's post about it on Instagram that I could have caught four Pokemon in the time it took me to save one baby hippogriff. So it, I'm sure that will improve as time goes on. Or maybe it won't. That's It's been really hit or miss with Harry Potter games just kind of in general. Um, cause I've been playing, I used to play more games when I was in middle school and high school and the Harry Potter games that came out then, like the first couple were, were real straightforward and then they started getting more complex and it didn't make any sense to play them that way. And then I liked the Hogwarts mystery game, but apparently it didn't have a way to save it unless it was connected to your Facebook. So I didn't pick that up again when I got a new phone. Um, but I don't know because the other Harry Potter games were made by other companies. Niantic seems like it's pretty well invested in making sure that things eventually work. So I'm hoping it's going to be more like Pokemon Go with further updates and iterations and once people start playing it and figuring out how things need to go after first release so that it's more streamlined and less clunky with unnecessary animation. The spell doesn't need to take a full 30 seconds, you know? Um, And again, I haven't played too much of it to, to have a terrible lot of criticism in the actual story type components that are apparently a part of this game. Um, yeah, I just don't think they've settled into their final thing yet. And it is still early days, so I might feel different about it in a couple of weeks once I've played it some more. Or I might go back to Pokemon where I can catch 12 Pokemon in the park instead of three um, confundables in the park. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but that's all I've got for you today. So that's the end of this podcast. Uh, show notes and everything are over at FreakishLemon.com, including transcripts of the episode. Um, come and join the group on Ravelry. Just search Freakish Lemon in the groups tab. You'll find us. If you want to follow me, uh, I'm Freakish Lemon at all the fun places like Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, and Ravelry. And all the links to these things will be in the down bar here on YouTube or somewhere around here if you're watching this somewhere else. And if you do want to follow along with what I'm doing, consider hitting that subscribe button here on YouTube so you know when I post new videos. And that's gonna do it for me. Goodbye.